Well, good morning, everyone. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Amen. I've been on leave this week, so it's been such a blessing. Uh, normally with work, I don't always get to come to all the meetings and that. So it's been such a blessing. But I see that this week while I was on leave, everybody saw me on Tuesday night. And then on Thursday night, they thought, oh, yes, Baron's going to be here again. <laughs> so then they used the excuse of, of rainy, stormy weather that's a warning by the weather service to cancel the meeting so they have to put up with me. Well, it backfired because now you're going to put up with me here this morning. <laughs> Amen. Um, but it's been a blessing. Uh, we were there at Outreach yesterday. And um, that's always a blessing, nerve-wracking, to share the word out in the street. But a blessing, a blessing from the Lord. And um, uh, yesterday, there's a guy there, we don't know his name, he's not in his right mind in that. Uh, we've called him Samuel, or Sam, short for, for Samuel. And the reason is because, you know, Samuel's mother couldn't have a child. And she sought the Lord and she had Samuel. Samuel was a miracle child. And we're praying for a miracle for this man. So his name is Samuel. Um, the Lord knows who we're talking about, so please remember to pray for Samuel. Okay, for Sam. Praying that you'll come to salvation and get his right mind. Um, there's another young guy on the street there. Uh, he's young, 21. His name's Wu. We've been praying for him. The Lord brought him across our path way back in the beginning of the outreach. Um, keep praying for him as well. We said to him yesterday, we, we're longing for the day when he comes to salvation and he's standing on the streets preaching with us. Um, so pray for him that day will come. Amen. Amen. Um, I've got a word from the Lord in my heart to share with you. Uh, but I wanted to start off this morning with a little bit of what I shared yesterday at the outreach. Um, you know the, the story of David and Goliath, such a wonderful story. Okay? Um, in fact, the world even adopted the story. The world loves a, a nice David and Goliath story for the rugby team from one of the smaller nations defeats the bigger nations. They love that. It's a David and Goliath scenario, and everybody rejoices, and the underdog, everybody supports the underdog. The world loves it because it's such a wonderful story. It's an inspiring story. Um, the Israelite nation are on one side, and the Philistine nation, are the armies of the two nations, enemies on one side. They want to go to war. Um, but amongst the Philistines, there's a man named Goliath. He's a giant of a man, um, a powerful, strong man. Uh, I'm sure some nations would use him in their scrums in these days in rugby. Um, but, uh, and he's trained to be a warrior from a child, the Bible says. So he's a dangerous man. And he comes down on a daily basis into a valley between these two hills. And he bellows out, he shouts out to the Israelite nation. He says, send me a man to fight me. If you will defeat me, then we will be your slaves. But if I defeat him, then you will be our slaves, our servants. And of course, everyone in the Philistine army look at this man. They see the size of this man and they see his strength. And, and they are absolutely afraid. Nobody wants to go. But then, a little bit down the drag, if I can say it like that, there's a man named Jesse, a father, whose sons are part of this battle in the Israelite nation. And this father says to his youngest son, David, go and see how your brothers are doing. And so the father sends his son to the battlefield to see how his brothers are doing. When he gets there, um, around about the time he's there to give food to his brothers and see how they're doing, Goliath comes down for his morning routine. And he bellows out, send me a man, are you afraid? And when they start shouting, by this stage, that this thing has worked on the, the Israelites so much that when they hear him, the Bible says they actually run and they hide. They don't just stand there and quake and look at him down there in the valley. They actually run and hide. Because they know not one of them are able to conquer this man. And you know, you think, surely there must be one man in the nation. What about the king, King Saul? The Bible says he stood head and shoulders above all other men. Goliath was bigger than him. But surely as the king, Saul, you've got to step up to the plate. But even he doesn't. Because even he knows he's no match for Goliath. But here's this, this, this young man, still a, a boy, I suppose, more, I tend to say more, a young man. And uh, he has all of this, and he sees the people running, and he says, he's absolutely shocked. He says, what's wrong with you guys? 
He says, who, who is this? Now look at the different points of view he gives. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he thinks he can defy the armies of the living God? Now you can see who he trusts in. You can see who, who he walks with day by day in his life. Who he spends time with. You can see who he's got a relationship with. You know, I love the way Paul writes in the one letter to Timothy. He says, I know in whom I believe, not what I believe, but in whom I have believed. And he says, and I'm persuaded. I'm willing to say that David knew in whom he believed. And that he was persuaded. And I want to ask you today, do you know in whom you believe? Are you persuaded in the Lord Almighty today? And so David says, well, I'll go. Whole long story. Uh, it comes to Saul, the king's ears, and he wants to see... David, and he wants to give David his armor and all of that. And David says, no, 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 I can't use all this armor. Let me just go. And Saul says to him, but you're a child. This man's been trained from a child to be a warrior. And David says, you know, the Lord who delivered a lion and a bear into my hands will deliver this man into my hands. And Saul says, okay, well, fine. Go for it. And uh, when he comes, Goliath mocks as well and says, what am I, a dog? Did you come to me with sticks and stones? He says, come, today I'll feed your flesh to the birds. And David says to him, you come to me with a sword and a spear. And your training and all those things. And the trust in your might and your power and your size. He says, but I'll come to you in the name of God Almighty. And today I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. And so the, the, he goes in. And the incredible thing is, the Israelites, when they hear the last voice, they run away. The closer David gets to the Goliath, he starts running even faster towards him. Because he knows in whom he believes. And he puts a stone in his sling and he swings it around and lets go. And right in the middle of the forehead, Goliath goes down. But it doesn't stop there. It's a bit of a gruesome side to it as well. Because David then runs up towards Goliath, takes Goliath's sword and cuts off Goliath's head and then picks his head up and holds it up to show the mighty Goliath has fallen. <laughs> the Philistines are shocked. They flee. The Israelites are rejoicing. They chase after the Philistines. And it's a wonderful, wonderful story of victory for the underdog, I could say. Although I don't know much of an underdog David really was and we know he was behind him. <laughs> and the Israelites knew victory that day because of David. But what does that nice, inspiring story have to do with you and I? What's it got to do with you and me? Nice story we hear and say, oh, such an inspiring story, a feel-good story. It's more than that. You see, in our life, we're in an army, we're in a battle, whether we know it or not. And we have an enemy. And that enemy has a Goliath. There's giants. And I don't know what the giant is in your life. Maybe you, you, you struggle with, with, with addiction. Maybe you're addicted to drugs or it's alcohol. Maybe it's a financial situation. There's many things in this life, but I don't know what your situation is. You know, as you sit here right now, the Lord speaks to you, touches your heart. You know what the giant is in your life. But you know, all those things... All those things, whether it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs or, or pornography or, or um, financial situation or whatever it may be. Is. Maybe it's a, you're in an adulterous affair. Whatever it may be, it all comes under one giant, one Goliath, and it's sin. And there's nothing you and I can do to defeat it. King Saul couldn't go against Goliath. We may think we're the king of our own lives. My life, I'll do it my way. You cannot defeat the Goliath of sin in your life. It's absolutely impossible. We can't do it alone. And you know what? Deep down, mankind knows this generally. Because when man has a problem, what do they do? They go to a counselor. Because they can't do it by themselves. They need help. They look for a church. They, they, they're always looking. They join a, a group of people, Alcoholics Anonymous, to help you. And we were saying yesterday, with the Alcoholics Anonymous, they say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You can't defeat that sin. 
You'll be sober for 40 years, but once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, it remains a giant in your life. But we have a father, not down the drag, but up in heaven. And he also said to his son, just like Jesse said to his son, to come and see how we do it. Say that with a pinch of salt because he knew. He knew we were in trouble in this battle and we needed help. And he sent Jesus to come for you and I. When Jesus went to that cross, he conquered Goliath. He didn't just drop him to the ground with a stone and hit him in his forehead. He cut off his head. And if we're in Jesus Christ, it's not a case of once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. The Bible says this, that when the Son, speaking of Jesus, makes you free, you are free indeed. And I want to ask you today, Will you allow Jesus to have his way? You see, when David was there, King Saul could have said, David, I'm not allowing it. I'm the king. If you go and you get slaughtered, your blood is on my hands. I'm not allowing it. We think we're the kings. Will we allow David, the Lord Jesus, to have his way in our life? Saul could have argued and said, no, this will be on my hands and I'm not going to allow it. The people will look at me as a child murderer or whatever the case is. It's exactly what we do. We say, oh, but Lord, giving our life to you is so hard. Oh, Lord, how am I going to enjoy my life? Lord, what about this? I need to first fix that, and I need to stop this, and I need to actually start doing this. And and Lord, I just, I don't know. Lord, let me me at least get some armor to try something. No. (laughs) No. Just let Jesus have his way. Just allow him to be in control. That's why he went to the cross. So you and I could have the victory. Amen. Amen. Here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, it says, What it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I want to plead with you today. If you will hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you today, harden not your hearts. Don't go out here and say, well, that was nice and and that touched me, but then carry on as you always have. Because then saying it was nice and it touched me means nothing. It's worthless. Don't go out like this. But if you will hear His voice today, if you will put His finger in your heart today, Don't harden your heart. Allow him to have his way. You know, in life, there's there's a a young baby. How old is she now? Almost six months. months. I have no memory of when I was six months. Anybody else here? (laughs) We we go through life. We're born as these little babies. We have to learn to, to use the toilets. We have to learn to feed ourselves, learn to walk learn to, to talk. Uh, I'm still learning that part of the talking part and getting there. Um, and and uh, why are you laughing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, then we have to go to school. When I was younger, I thought, Bleh, school. Now I actually miss school. <laughs> that was the good laugh. Um, and then we have to study for exams and learn things and get out of school and look at what we want to do with our lives and start a career and start working and earn money and then find a spouse and get married and then have kids of our own that are going to go through the same thing we went through and then get a dog and a cat and, and couches and cars and go through life and then reach the end of your career and you're going to go on pension and you retire and you're going to take your money, live a few more years and then you die. <laughs> So there's life wrapped up in a matter of, what, a minute. <laughs> uh, but there's more to life than that. There's more to life than that. And I want to ask you, what is your life? What is your life? If you, what is life all about? You know, I explained the whole of life there very briefly, obviously, but within a minute. But you know, that's actually what life is like when you compare it to eternity. Because here in James chapter 4, it tells us what our life is. 
James chapter 4, I'll read from verse 13. He says, Go now, you that say today or tomorrow will go to such a city and continue there for a year and buy and sell and get going. So basically what he's talking about is those folk who are saying, this is my plan for my life. I'm going to do this and do that. And then after this, I'm going to go and do that. And, and I want to achieve this. And we make all our plans. And then verse 14, he says, but you know not what shall be on the morrow. You, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We've got all these plans, but we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't even know if we're going to be here tomorrow. And then he goes on and he says this, For what is your life? He says it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, whenever I read this, I always think of this example. I love coffee. Um, I'm addicted to coffee. And um, whenever I boil the kettle, there's a, a point where there's steam coming at the kettle. But once it's finished boiling, that steam is gone. It's just not even a minute. A vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. That's what our life is. When you compare it to eternity, what waits when we leave this earth? But you and I put so much emphasis on this time. But there's so much more than that. And to prepare for that, we need to allow David, Jesus, to have his way in our life. What are you going to do with your vapor? Are you going to try and be in control of it and stay afraid of Goliath the rest of your life? Or are you going to say, wow, there's my king. There's Jesus. Jesus, here's the vapor. It's yours. And no victory and joy. It's up to us. But our life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And if that's the case, we better make sure as soon as we can, if you haven't already, as soon as possible, that you are in Jesus Christ. That you have surrendered to Him and allow Him to have His way in your life. Allow Him to go and face that Goliath that you struggle with. I used to think it myself. I used to think, you know, before I come to the Lord, well, there was a time when the Lord was working with me and I thought, before I come to the Lord, I need to do this and I need to stop that. And it's like, oh Lord, I don't know if I can do this. But it's not like that. Just allow Jesus to reign. And as He works with you, those things will start to fade away in your life. You, you won't want them in your life. You yourself will toss them aside. You know, I also used to think when I was younger, people would come and talk to me, old friends or whatever, and they would say, oh no, I'm born again, I gave my life to Jesus. And I used to say to them, wow, with no sarcasm, I wasn't sarcastic about it, wow, that's so awesome, I'm so happy for you, good for you. And then I would make the mistake at that stage, I thought, and I would say to them, I wish I could do that. And they would say to me, you can. And then I should step back and say, whoa, 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 no, 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 you don't understand. Not me. I don't know if you make me feel like that today. But I want to tell you, yes, you. You can. Why do I know that? Because the Father has sent His Son. Jesus has gone to the cross of Calvary. He gave His life for you and His blood is shed. And then three days later, the stone was rolled away and He rose again victorious. Yes, you. <laughs> you might say, oh, but you don't understand. You don't know me. I don't need to know you. But He does. He does. And why do you think you're here today? Because you decided to do that. You decided to come to church. No. Even if you come here every week. <laughs> it's not just because you come here every week that you're here. If you're visiting, it's not because you, you decided to come today that... No. God, from before the foundation, ordained and planned for this today. You might say, oh, but you don't say, I thought and we discussed and so we planned to do this today. No. You thought and discussed and planned because God put that in you. So you would come and hear His word today. Why? Because He loves you. And He's calling out to you.
We need to make sure we are in Christ. You see, outside of Christ, we don't have love. Just one verse here quickly in Colossians, the book of Colossians. If I can get there. He says this, um, verse 4, When Christ, who is our love, shall appear then, so you also appear with him in glory. But I love that. When Christ who is our love. So let me say this, if you and I are outside of Christ, we don't have love. And that might seem like a contradiction, because you might say, but I'm living, I'm breathing, I'm doing things every day. Yes, you might be doing that, but you're alive in the flesh, the flesh which is going to die, as I explained life in that short minutes. But spiritual life, eternal love, you do not have. And when you die, then it's not a pretty sight. The Bible talks about the man who built his house in the sand, living his life in man's wisdom, man's ways, being the king of his own love, never conquering the Goliath, the sin in his love. The Bible says when his house fell, it says it was a great fall. Because if you leave this life without knowing Jesus Christ, it is a great fall. But if we are in Christ, then He is our love. Then we know love. Then we have love. The Bible says Jesus is the light of man and the life of man. <laughs> and so we're going to make sure we are in Jesus Christ. And I, I want to say, when I say make sure we are in Jesus Christ, I'm not saying claim to be in Jesus Christ. You see, this is the thing in life. We have those that are born again. And then we have what I'm going to term claimers. Are you a claimer today? Are you born again? Do you know Jesus? The example I always, always use every time. Uh, I've got a sister in America. Uh, she's a nurse. Uh, she's married. And she has two kids. Her first is a boy. His name is Thomas. The youngest is a girl. Her name is Rose. Um, so let me ask you a question. Do I have a sister? Yes. Where does she live? America. Oh. Is she married? Do you know my sister? No, you don't. Does she, does she have kids? How many? Two. What are they? Boy and girl. Do you know their names? Thomas and Rose. Are you sure you don't know my sister? You know an awful lot about her. Eh? You see, you know all this stuff, obviously, because I've just told you. She's upset. You, you know all this stuff. Because I've just told you about But if she walks in that door now, would you know that's my sister I've just told you about? Unless I said to you, that's my sister Amanda that I was telling you about. Otherwise you wouldn't know. Now you see, you and I can know a lot about Jesus. We can go to church and hear about Him. We can read the Bible and learn a lot about Him. But knowing about Him is not enough. See, when I'm stuck in that place, then I'm a claimer. I need to know Him personally and intimately. Here in Romans chapter 8, this is the person that's that knows the Lord personally and intimately. The person who is born again, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. We are free. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirits. So there's a distinct difference. Because there's many that claim to be in Christ Jesus. But those people cannot say they are stuck in a place where there's no condemnation. Otherwise, we would all say we are not in condemnation. But those that have no condemnation, that are in Jesus, not just claiming, are those that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. They live their lives by the grace of God in obedience to Him. There's a distinct difference. 
those are those that are born again. But then you get claimers. And, and yes, I understand you get many different types of, of claimers. Um, but I, I want to just talk about two types of claimers today. And the one claimer is what I've, I've put, joking obviously, but there is a serious side to it, obviously. Um, the one claimer I've put is the amateur claimer. The novice claimer. That's the guy that, that comes to church every now and again. And when he's here, he, he, he tries to talk, the, talk the, the church Christian lingo. And he thinks he's got it, but when you listen, you can hear he doesn't really have it. Although the lingo is not what makes us saved. But it's a, the novice claimer. Comes every now and again. Tries to, 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 to talk the church lingo. Tries to, to look good. Tries to, to, to show he's putting his money in there. Tries to, to you know, that's the, the novice guy. But yet his love and his heart is living for himself. When he's not here, outside there, he's still chasing the things of the world. The lust and the desires of the flesh have still gripped him and he's not letting go. And he doesn't want to let go of those things because he enjoys those things too much. He loves those things too much. In the Bible here, John chapter 3, verse 19 says this, because that person who's a claimer cannot say he's in a place of no condemnation. The Bible says this here, this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. Jesus has come into the world. Jesse sent his son David for Israel. God our Father sent his son Jesus for you and I. Light has come into the world. And mankind, men have loved darkness rather than the light. Because their deeds were evil. Now when you put it to, to the, the, the novice claim, I would say, and you say to that person, you love your alcohol more than you love the Lord. You love your career, or whatever it may be, more than you love the Lord. You love your adulterous affair more than you love the Lord, whatever it is. They'll say, no, 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 that's not true. Yes, it is true, because why can you not let go of those things? You love them more. And it's become a massive giant in your life. But Satan has, has closed your eyes and deceived you. Instead of showing you that it's an enemy now like Goliath, he's showing you that, whoa, well, Goliath is now on your side. It's nice. It's enjoyable. Because let's be honest, sin to the flesh, it's not ugly to the flesh. To the flesh, sin is good. It's an enjoyable thing. And when I'm walking in the flesh, I love those things more than the Lord. And I want to beg with you today, please don't be a novice claimer. Please don't be that person. If you're struggling with this specific thing, then please allow Jesus to come in and to slay that Goliath that's sin in your life. Please. Time is short and Jesus is coming soon. The other claimer you get is what I call the master expert claimer. This is the person, uh, you can turn so long to John chapter 11. This is the person that comes to church on a regular basis. Jolly good fellow. Puts on a very good show. Has got the church Christian lingo down to the T. Although sometimes, if you're talking to them, you might get them in a corner with it. And then when they expose, they'll quickly change the topic or, or flee because they need to do something somewhere. But otherwise, other, otherwise they, they generally they've got it right and, and will deceive many if not most to say, no, they, they, they're in the right place. There was a lady here in John chapter 11 like that. What's happened here is, is Jesus has got word that Lazarus, first they tell him he's sick and then he's died. He tells his disciples he's sleeping and they confuse. Eventually he tells them he's dead. And so he goes to go and see Lazarus. And Lazarus has got two sisters, Mary and Martha. There's a lady named Martha here from verse 21. While Jesus is coming, Martha um, goes to see him. In verse 21 it says, Then said Martha unto Jesus when she got to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jolly good. 
good show of faith. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's the first to go and see him. And then she says, but I know that even now, whatever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Wow. Surely, surely she's, she must be uh, an example of a born again person. Was it an example of a master expert claimer? You see, you know, with David, when he was anointed king by, by the prophet Samuel, Samuel went there and he went through all the brothers, and every brother he saw, he thought, oh, this must be him. Oh, okay, this must be him. But God said to Samuel, don't look on the outward appearance. But look in the heart, that's what I think, look in the heart. And even here amongst us, whether we claim as a born again, God sees into the heart. And here, Jesus is looking into her heart. And she says this to him, whatever you ask of God now, I know you'll give it to him. And Jesus says to her, with her wonderful claims of faith there, your brother will rise again. And Martha says unto him, I know that he will rise again. In the resurrection at the last day. So she starts, starts to get a little bit shaky. And Jesus says to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe? Do you believe this? Do you see what Jesus has just done? He's just shared the gospel with us. Jesus has just shared the gospel with a woman claiming to have the utmost outstanding faith because he sees the hearts. She's got the lingo, she's got the dress code, she's got everything. But Jesus sees the hearts. And then she says unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Wow, well, that's the that she's definitely right. Guys, once upon a time, I said the same thing in my own life. These exact words that Martha uses, I use those same words. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. You died on the cross, I said those things, but yet I was not born again. Words can be empty. And after she says this, because that's like, well, surely that shows. She tries to cover up the shakiness she's shown. Then she says to him, and when she had so said, she quickly went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly. So why did she call Mary secretly? The, read on. She says to him, the master, speaking of Jesus, come, and he calls for you. Did you read anywhere where Jesus said, please call Mary for me? That's why she calls Mary secretly. She's like, I'm getting exposed here by the Lord. Let me just get Mary to go and talk to you. <laughs> Guys, let's not be stuck in that place. Let, let's go on and see what happens from verse 39. They get to where Lazarus is buried and Jesus says, Take away the stone. Martha, his sister, says to the Lord, Lord, by this time he stinks. He's been dead for four days. The Lord has said, roll away the stone. <laughs> Martha has her heart exposed again. And Jesus said unto her, Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, if you would believe, what is that? Mean? She's not believing. You would see the glory of God. If you would believe. And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he prays. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I, I, I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of these people which stand by, I've said this, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the grave. And I just say, Wow. It's incredible. It's a good thing that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he just said, come forth, I don't know how many people would have come out of the graves that day. 
Lazarus comes out alive. Do you believe that Jesus can make you feel alive again? <clears throat> if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God. And you'd even see it in your own life. You'd experience it. You'd get to know Him. And He'd give you a joy and a victory like you've never known before. A rest, a peace unto your soul. <laughs> That's something that's eternal. You see, if we, if we stay in that place of, of being claimers, it's a dangerous place to be in. In Galatians 6, uh, verse 7, I read verse 7 and it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, however he lives his life, that shall he also reap. For if he sows to his flesh, if he lives to his flesh, and if I'm in a place where I'm a claimer, then I'm living to my flesh. Because I haven't yet met personally with the Lord. I'm not born again. I'm not walking in that spirit. If he sows to his flesh, he shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. <laughs> You know, you know there, there's a saying of being there, done that. And, and I've been there, I've been in the world. And I've been in that place where I thought that serving the Lord was not fun, it was boring, and I didn't want that. And I thought the life I was living then, then man, that's fun, that's joy and excitement. And now by the grace of God, I've had years where I could walk with the Lord and, and the things that the Lord has done in my life and even in me now, I can honestly tell you that that then was not fun. That then was not joy. What I have now in Jesus, I wouldn't trade for the world. Lose my soul for what? <laughs> the world. I'm not talking about born again people being perfect. It's not about that perfection. You see, a born again believer knows that when he falls into a temptation, he can come and confess before his Lord and his Lord is faithful and just to forgive him. And he takes that forgiveness. He doesn't wallow in guilt because he knows that his Lord loves him. It's good to feel bad for us. But when you come before the Lord, know that he forgives you. I wouldn't trade this for the world. And I'm saying to you today, don't be stuck in a battle where you have no hope of winning. Don't be faced with a Goliath that said that you have no chance of overcoming. Allow David to fight that battle. If we allow Jesus in, David had to still fight the battle. Jesus already has. He's already risen. He's already on the right hand of the Father. Allow him to have his way. You know, Martha, the, the, the dangerous place about, thing about being a claimer is that they can see things happening around them. They can hear about wonderful things. But unless they meet with Jesus, it makes no difference. Martha didn't have that personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Because after that, you can go and read on there in John chapter 12 that Jesus is at Bethany again and um, Lazarus is sitting at the table with him. Mary's at his feet with ointment wiping his, his feet with her hair. But Martha's still serving. If you go read in Luke chapter 10, there's a count there where Martha is serving. There's many people around. Mary's at his feet and she complains. She says, Lord, don't you care that I'm busy and Mary's doing nothing? Get her to come and help me. And Jesus, seeing her heart, says, Martha, you're troubled and busy with many things. You're coming about many things. But he says to her, he says, one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part. Guys, let me tell you this. Our life, as we said, is a vapor. 
And we think it's so complicated to give our life to the Lord. And what about this and that and this and this and, and all this and there and, and this and I need to learn. No, no, no. One thing is needful. I think the Lord did it on the on purpose. Because he knows our life is just a vapor. It's just one thing is needful. You and I will be found at the feet of our Savior. You would know him personally and intimately. He wants to know you like that. That's why he shares this word like this. <coughs> One thing is needful. If you go back to, to Hebrews 3, we read verse 15. It says the same thing if you read from verse 7. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, well, I believe today that the Holy Ghost has said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. He says, just like the children of Israel did in the wilderness. He says, when they tempted me and they proved me and they saw my works for 40 years, just like Martha had seen. But he says, I was grieved with that generation. And I said, they would always err, they are always in error. Where? In their heart. We can claim and put on the show outside very well. The Lord looks at the hearts. He says they've always earned their hearts and they have not known my ways. Who here knows my ways? Maybe my wife knows my ways because she knows me. You want to know God's ways? You want to know the Lord's ways? Allow him in and get to know him. And you'll get to know his ways. With that generation, because they always earned their hearts and they did not know his ways, he said, and so I swear in my wrath, they will not enter into my rest. Because we will not know rest unless we know Jesus. I'm not saying that as a nice church language or a Bible language then. I'm saying that's what the Lord says. Today as the Holy Ghost say. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Take heed. Today. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God. I want to read this verse again. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. <clears throat> Guys, we don't know what's going, what's going to happen tomorrow. Life is a vapor. Here and today, the voice of the Lord is spoken. You know, you know when the Lord speaks? This is something I've also learned about the Lord over the years. When He speaks, He speaks from His heart. So as we've heard His voice today, we've heard His heart. And His heart is crying out, calling out for you. He also says that he, he will not always, His Spirit will not always strive with man. The time is coming when it's going to be too late. Either if we die before we come to Jesus, or if Jesus comes. But life is a vapor. We don't know when these things are going to happen. It could be tonight. And I'm saying to you today, if you're, if you're not in the right place, if you're not born again, you don't know Jesus personally and intimately today, call out to Jesus. Make right with Him. Get to know Him. Ask Him to come in and to be the Lord and Savior of your life. To give you the forgiveness you need and to start working with you that you may know His joy and His victory in your life. Normally at the end of a meeting like this, we'll pray. We'll ask people to raise their hands. I'm not going to do that. Because you've got to make right with the Lord. But I'm going to ask you, if the Lord has spoken to you, He's touched your heart, Please, guys, come and speak to us. Come speak to me. Come speak to Dave. Come speak to Mark. Whoever. There's other guys around here. Please. 
Don't wait for tomorrow. The Lord loves us and He's calling out for us. That's why He came and went to the cross. Amen. 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 Today, we close and pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Again, Lord, we come here this morning, Father God, and we are we so grateful, Lord, because again, you've reminded us, you've reminded us of the joy it is to be in a relationship with your son, Jesus. You've reminded us what the joy it is to know that we're going to have an eternal life in glory with you one day. So, God, again, I just thank you for this reminding that you've reminded us. And, Lord, that you've reminded us, again, that are born again. What a glory we have to look forward to. Again, you've reminded us, Father God, that we can do nothing on our own. But it's all by Jesus, by having Jesus within our hearts, within our lives, that's going to make that possible, make that inheritance of the kingdom of God possible for us. And Lord, we thank you as born again people that we've come here this morning and we've been reminded of that wonderful relationship that we have with you and with the Father. And it's not of a religion, but of a relationship. And Father God, again, we just say thank you again, Lord, that if there are any members in here too, Father God, that you've spoken to that may not be born again, where you've spoken so clearly and said to them to come Find Jesus. Have that relationship with Jesus. Get to know the Father. Have that surety of an eternal glory with the King of Kings. Lord, I just pray that, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that their hearts may be softened today and to respond to what you said, Lord, because we know very well it wasn't Baron standing up there speaking, but it was Baron speaking your words to the people today because you love each and every one of us. So I just again pray, Lord, that hearts are softened today and people don't walk out of here, Father God. God, and let their hearts be hardened within a moment in the world, but let their hearts be softened and take hold of Jesus. So again, we just thank you so much for the way you speak to each one of us, and we love you so much, Father God, and yes, Lord, we love being in that relationship with our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, and we just say, Lord, we just pray that each person will go today and be full of Jesus. And more so, go today. And when we go in our separate ways, Lord, we go out there and let the whosoever's not see us, but again, see that light of Jesus in us. So we just say thank you in your most wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.